Well, good afternoon to all, and thank you for participating today and coming, and it's a blessing. Thank you for uh, Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo, and thank you for her comments. Thank you for her service to the state, but also to her service to the Wildlife Corridor. I'm Jeb Smith. I am a fifth generation farmer from St. Johns County in the little town of Hastings. Uh, my family's been farming on the same property there for over 100 years, and I was elected to be president of the Florida Farm Bureau back in October of 2021. This panel today has been established for and designed to, uh, to be able to develop an appreciation for the deep connection between Florida's ecology and economy. Likewise, it is to be here to gain an opportunity of the triumphs and challenges many public sector industries are facing as they try to drive profit while making environmental conscious decisions. Uh, it's also to provide you to hear some places and connection of opportunity for future collaborations and efforts. And I can tell you, we have assembled some, an outstanding panel of guests for the, uh, today's discussion. Uh, but before I invite our uh, our members to come on stage. I wanted to just give you a little bit, especially in my background in agriculture, some very important facts. You know, there are about 34.3 million acres in the state of Florida, uh, and about 9.72 million of those are committed to agriculture. And then some of those are also, that 34, about half of it is 17 million in uh, forest lands. You know, there are about 47,500 farms in the state of Florida, which is equates to about 204 acres per each farm. But the economy is very dependent on agriculture. In 2020, $7.41 billion uh, in total cash receipts were derived by our, our agricultural operations in the state. The leading commodities were floriculture, oranges, sugar cane, and fresh market tomatoes. Florida is the second largest industry uh, in is farming in the state of Florida's Florida's second largest industry is farming. Sometimes it attains the number one spot, especially when tourism is subjected to an economic downturn. Uh, ecology. Agriculture is very important to our state's ecology. Agriculture and civic culture both are critical to our state's environmental health. Uh, you know, we've got water recharge, wildlife habitat, open green space, carbon sequestration are just a few benefits that agriculture lands provide. However, it is important to remember this, that landowners cannot own and maintain their properties for free. The land must generate a revenue to pay for ad valorem taxes and to maintain those properties, especially against invasive plants and, and creatures. But many things threaten agriculture's financial viability whether it be disease, trade, labor, regulation, taxes, inflation, market prices. It's very, very important to recognize that when the financial environment is tough, that there is a strong desire for others to purchase our valuable asset of the land. And it's tempting to liquidate that as a landowner in agriculture before all our equity is consumed in risky business. Uh, many will 1031 their exchange their properties for less expensive properties in other areas of the state or in other states. Uh, in the last five years, 130,000 acres of ag and natural lands have been lost to development. And what can be done to preserve and, and uh, th those, some of those and generate some income for landowners to stay in agriculture and not have that land to be developed or turn into other lucrative options? Just two things to keep in mind. Number one, there's a an idea of payment for environmental services that would make it pro profitable for agriculture to stay in business. And secondly, conservation easements are a very viable tool, whether it be the Florida Forever or the Rural Family Lands Protection Act. Just a few comments that I wanted to provide to you, especially in agriculture, as we will now introduce our, our panelists as they come forward. I'd like to invite to the stage Miss Dana Young. Start with Miss Dana uh, Young and then Next on our, if you want to come on out, Miss Dana Young. We also have with us Jeff West. We have Mr. Richard Levy. And then finally, Mr. Michael Alfano. Thank you all for it. Give them a, please give them a round of applause.
What I'm going to do is introduce each of these in their bio today and give them an opportunity to kind of speak a little bit about what they do and who they are. And so I'm going to begin, first of all, with Mr. Richard Levy. Mr. Richard Levy is uh, actually Dr. Richard Levy, and he is a land use and real estate development executive with extensive experience in public and private sector economic development mm -hmm. strategy and execution. An established expert in his field, he has extensive experience serving the Central Florida area. He founded his independent consulting firm in 2012, providing strategic advisory services to local governments and private investors. Dr. Levy served as the City of Orlando's City Planning Bureau Chief before taking on a role as Chief Administrative Officer in 1999. In 2005, Dr. Levy made a shift out of the public sector Make, taking a uh, position of Director of Entitlements at Donald W. McIntosh & Associates. And then in 2007, Dr. Levy became the Vice President of Lake Nona Property Holdings LLC, now called Tavistock Development Company. Dr. Levy received his PhD in Public Affairs and Policy Research from the University of Central Florida. He has an MA in Ge Geography and Spatial Analysis of Land Use from Arizona State University and a BA in Geography Urban Studies from Wittenberg University. Would you please welcome Dr. Richard Levy. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Levy, tell us just a little about who you are and what you, what you do. Well, you gave a, gosh, I feel like a dinosaur. You gave me 30 years of, or 35 years of my history, but uh, today I'm um, here to talk about uh, the Project Sunbridge, uh, which is a 25,000 acre mixed use a master plan community um, in Osceola County and Orange County. Tavistock Development Company, you may be aware, is also the developer of the Lake Nona uh, project in the city of Orlando. We are placemakers, and in the Sunbridge project, uh, we had a tour this morning, 50 of you out there looked at it. Uh, we're building what we believe to be the prototypical uh, corridor uh, compatible community, um, taking um, um, using the project as a living laboratory to, to test a whole um, number of um, initiatives having to do with alternative landscapes, water conservation, water quality preservation. I'll talk some more in a, in a little bit about that. Well, thank you for being with us, Dr. Levy. My next guest I'd like to introduce and just read a little bit about is Jeff West. Jeff is a senior project manager and part of the largest solar expansion in the United States with Florida Power and Light. Jeff is an accomplished project manager with strong regulatory foundation and a 10 plus year history of successful permit acquisition and management of renewable development projects, primarily in wind and solar sectors. Jeff has a proven, had a proven success throughout Southeast, Texas, and Maine. A passion for Florida's fauna and flora is, is a value both he and his wife, an environmental attorney, hope to pass on to their children. Camping, hiking, and spending time outdoors is a central part of their life. Welcome to this panel, Jeff, it's good to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jeb. Um, thanks for that introduction, and I look forward to our, our panel discussion. Um, I, before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about FPL and our solar program. Uh, so, as you may know, FPL is a leader in the clean ener energy industry and sustainability. Uh, and as such, they're committed to delivering America's cleanest energy. And we do that by providing the cleanest most reliable power uh, to our 12 million customers across the state um, and doing that below the national average uh, for cost. We do that by making investments, uh, the investments we've made and continue to make in clean technology. Uh, in fact, our solar operating program is the largest in, in Florida. Uh, we have projects, uh, over 60 projects spanning across the state. Uh, because we're a green company, uh, our commitment to the environment is, is bar none. We, uh, our commitment to sustainability uh, is, drives everything we do, um, and our stewardship and, and environmental protection is, is part of our DNA. And it's made us an industry leader for decades. And I can say that with confidence because 23 years ago, I started as an intern at Florida Power and Light giving uh, interpretive tours of the Barley Barber Swamp, um, which was adjacent to our Indian Town power plant. I don't know if you've ever been to Indian Town or, or to that, that tour, but um, 
At the time, you know, the power plant itself was an oil fire generating plant, the largest in the country. And we've since converted that to clean, clean natural gas. And that same mantra of basically stewardship and education is carried through today. And now we're on amidst our, our greatest solar expansion. So our commitment to environmental sustainability is not only the right thing to do, but it makes good business sense. Our commitment to compliance, conservation, communication, and continued improvement fosters in our company um, a culture of environmental excellence that we carry through our business planning, our operations, and our daily work. In fact, um, you know, environmental stewardship is a key consideration when we're developing all aspects of our solar projects. So that's from siting, design, construction, and operation. And it's really that process that makes us not only great neighbors to the community and people that live adjacent to our projects, but also in partners in conservation for all of our many NGO stakeholders um, and regulatory uh, stakeholders as well. So I look forward to this discussion. Um, and I'd be amiss if I didn't recognize I have several colleagues out there. I uh, have a lot of experience in, in working with solar and the environment. So I, I encourage you to reach out them, to them over the next couple of days and connect, because that's why we're here, is to connect and foster uh, this relationship of preservation and conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our next panelist is Ms. Dana Young, President and Chief Executive Officer of Visit Florida. Dana Young leads Florida's official destination marketing organization, Visit Florida, in partnership with its board of directors and the statewide tourism industry. Throughout her career, Dana has served in leadership positions, working to cultivate and protect Florida's exceptional business climate and a world-class quality of life. Dana served in the Florida House from 2010 to 2016, rising to majority leader in 2015 and in 2016 legislative sessions. In 2016, she was elect elected to the Florida Senate, where she represented parts of Western Hillsborough County for two years. Dana was appointed to the Visit Florida position by Governor Ron DeSantis in January of 2019. In addition to her duties as president and CEO, she is a member of the U.S. Travel Association's Chairman's Circle and Executive Board. Dana is a sixth generation Floridian and was born and raised in Tallahassee. She received her undergraduate degree in political science from Florida State University and in pursuit of her interest in law and public policy, graduated from University of Virginia law, a School of Law in 1993 and maintained a robust environmental law practice for many years. In her free time, which doesn't sound like there's much, Dana <laughs> enjoys spending time in natural Florida and tarpon fishing with her husband, Matt, and two daughters, Alexandra and Carson. Please help me welcome Ms. Dana Young. Thank you, Jeb, and it, I'm just so uh, honored to be here today. Um, I'm not going to spoil my presentation by saying too much, but you know there is an obvious intersection between tourism and environmental conservation and preservation, and Visit Florida has embraced this for many years. Uh, we have some exciting new things um, coming up starting next month, and so I will be talking with you about all of those things in a few minutes. Well, thank you for being with us, Ms. Thank Young. You. Appreciate that. Our next guest is Michael Alfano, Principal Planner for Blueprint Intergovernmental Agency. Michael is responsible for planning and managing Blueprint projects, which promote holistic infrastructure planning and community redevelopment. The program aims to build infrastructure that aligns with the community's vision and promotes multi-use corridors, park-like regional stormwater facilities, alternative transportation, passive recreation, and wildlife habitat preservation. Michael Alfano is an experienced planner with, de dem with a demonstrated history of working in the public policy industry. Michael is skilled in public education and engagement, policy development, communications, and issue advisory relating to local governance. Michael is a dedicated public servant with a Master of Science in Planning, focused on urban and regional planning, and a Master of Public Administration, focused on policy analysis and evaluation from, the, from Florida State University, a Juris Doctorate for focused in international legal studies from the University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law. Is that true? It's Florida State as well. 
Uh, no. No, that's the University of Florida. That's a typo in here. I knew he told me it was University of Florida, and I didn't thought, man, he might have lied to me, but that's not true. <laughs> Michael, thank you for being with us. Please welcome Michael Afano. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Jeb. I bleed orange and blue for there sure. There you go. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, the Blueprint Inter Intergovernmental Agency is a joint city of Tallahassee, Leon County government agency that implements infrastructure projects utilizing a one penny sales tax. Um, we currently have 32 projects that uh, when completed will provide over 121 new miles of bicycle and pedestrian facilities, over 338 acres of new parks and public spaces, including seven new public parks and thousands of new tree plantings. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the um, importance of trails and connecting gray and green infrastructure and how that can spur economic development. Well, thank you, Mr. Alfano. Please help me welcome Mr. Alfano to the stage. The structure we're going to do, I'm going to ask you just a few questions to each of our panelists and kind of get a little more familiarity with what they're doing and how they're used, being, utilizing their skills and their business to be a part of the wildlife corridor as well as here, ecology and economy. I'm going to begin with Mr. Levy. Mr. Levy with Tavistock Development and Company. You mentioned the, the Sunbridge development a little while ago. A tour has been done today, so some of our, our audience has been on and been actually able to experience Sunbridge. You have a unique approach to landscape and effective ecology at Sunbridge. Would you care to tell us a little bit about that? Sure, when we embarked on uh, the development uh, plan for the project, and we are the master uh, developers, our land owner partner is the Church of the Latter-day Saints. They're 300, plus or minus 300,000 acre Desiree Ranch uh, this is the western portion of the ranch, and uh, the ranch has been an unbelievable steward of the land. We're one of the 10 or 11 stewardship districts, independent special districts in Florida. When we embarked on the planning for this project, we knew one thing for sure, and that is we were going to be limited, we are going to have limited water supply, and I think I told the story this morning. I've been around so long in the 80s when the first growth management acts came out, um, and concurrency was created. Transportation was the single limiting factor. Transportation capacity was the single limiting factor to development in Florida. Oftentimes projects would get stopped or slowed down because there wasn't sufficient capacity in the transportation system. I think water is today's transportation. Uh, we believe that long-term water supplies are limited, and so when we embarked on, on setting up this project, we knew with this incredible ecosystem that this land contains um, a chain of lakes and 70% of the land is gonna be preserved in conservation, we knew we had limited water supplies and had to come up with a, an approach to limit demand for water. Uh, what we all know is that the majority of water consumed in Florida, residentially at least, is consumed outside the home, not inside the home. And so we structured a, a collaboration with some private sector partners, Cherry Lake Farms, uh, our nursery provider, uh, Life Soils, uh, University of Florida, University of Central Florida, Nature Conservancy. We built this collaborative effort to um, design alternative landscapes, which involved majority native, native plants, uh, limited turf, uh, conventional landscapes are not part of Sunbridge. Um, the neighborhoods that we're developing, no more St. Augustine, it's all very limited turf, mostly native plants, and, and had to come up with um, a way to reduce water consumption. And, and uh, these landscapes also provide ecosystem services, which um, uh, pollinators, and I'm not the expert here, uh, from a policy standpoint, we knew we had to come up with a solution. And so from a corridor compatibility standpoint, trying to create these, these, this built landscape that blended and, and wasn't such a hard line with the natural ecosystem has really been important. So um, this is what we've embarked on and we've got some other um, research. This is a, there's applied research going on right now. We found that we can reduce outside water consumption by about 50% and really drive down consumption, which for our business is really important because we can be around longer with a longer water supply. Well, thank you, Dr. Levy. D describe some of the, the impressive land features and natural features that this property possesses and then what you've done to actually protect them. So, So thank you. The, um, there is a chain of lakes um, that uh, three very large lakes that are 
um, interconnected by canal, and, and this property sits at the headwaters of the St. Johns River, as well as the headwaters of the um, Kissimmee River. So two huge natural systems in the state, and uh, we're at the, at the top of the hill, if you will, which further um, uh, indicated us that we really needed to take care of how we go about um, developing. And then these lakes, as I pointed out on the tour this morning, we're not building, no homes will be on the edge of the lakes. You won't see private docks. You, the, everything will be separated away from um, the lakes. The lakes will be kept really for uh, public benefit, not private benefit. And we're, we've got extensive lake management planning, um, talking about limiting size and type of watercraft. Uh, uh, perhaps non-motorized watercraft, uh, or um, you know, looking at uh, perhaps limiting any fossil fuel watercraft, maybe going with all electric. Hey, we're just looking at ways. This is the this is the heart of water supply in in uh, the state, flowing down these rivers, and we have a steward's mentality of maintain of protecting it. Well, that's impressive because it, what you're doing there is protecting the and lessening the impact of folks down the downstream. That's for sure. And thank y'all for it. That's a, it's very impressive, and I thank you for sharing that because it is unique in its, its approach. I want to move along next to Mr. West. Mr. West is FPNL, and I tell you what, solar is becoming a large and large part. Most of us are traveling the interstates. We see it even on the back roads. We're starting to see a lot of solar that uh, is taking up the landscape. And how does solar play a role in wildlife corridor strategy? And why do you feel that solar is compatible with the wildlife corridor? Well, thank you, Jeb. Um, I've got a couple of slides that uh, we can queue up that'll kind of help illustrate uh, that answer for you. Um, but in general, there's a couple of things uh, with our projects. The solar sites themselves and the way they flow with the natural landscape is, is one way that they embody the elements of kind of the wildlife corridor. And we have some examples to show. Um, also, the process we take in, let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, we're still not seeing it. Yeah, it's out you guys there. see it? We see it, we okay. see it up here. That's what you're All right. Saying. So um, the, the process we take in, in designing um, our projects and selecting them, uh, we try to make sure, as I said earlier, that environmental stewardship is a key consideration in all aspects of project planning. So that, that starts with the siting process, um, through design, construction, stakeholder outreach, and operations. Uh, we're gonna be operating these sites for 30 years, so we wanna make sure that environmental stewardship is a key component. After all, we own the property, so we have a vested interest in being stewards of the land for the life of that project. Uh, the sites themselves um, are fairly low impact sites. Uh, the panels sit low to the ground, uh, we, we try to find land that's been previously disturbed. So we have sites all across uh, the state from Miami-Dade all the way up to Nassau County and west to Pensacola. So varying topography and landscapes. Uh, we try to choose land that's already been previously disturbed. Uh, in the south, you might see a lot of uh, fallow citrus that has been converted to solar. Uh, we try to stabilize that ground first, as you can see in the pictures here. Uh, with, with vegetation and grass, uh, less than 2% of the site is impacting the soil or what we would call impervious. So part of that is conservation. Um, we talked about water a little bit. So our sites protect water and watershed. We're not using any water um, on these sites. So it allows the ground to kind of recuperate and, and, and clean that water before it gets to the, the watershed. Um, Another aspect of our sites is they are benefits to clean air, obviously, and clean water. Each one of our sites is equi produces equivalent power, zero emissions power, uh, to about 15,000 homes. That's about 12,000 cars being removed from the road annually. Um, so that's part of the conservation, or part of, we call it our four pillars of stewardship. So we've got conservation um, and protection. Uh, then we have wildlife. So as we design our sites, um, we make sure that we are using standard fencing around the sites. Um, and this is to help facilitate wildlife movement across the sites. Uh, as you can see here, we've, got, um, we've done a number of camera studies at several of our sites down in South Florida. 
and we've got pictures of over 2,300 different species using uh, and crossing our sites. Uh, in the pictures here, you can see some deer, um, some bears, of course, caracaras, and then a bobcat. Um, most notably, though, we, you know, we've seen panthers at our sargrass site in Hendry County. Um, so this was, a, this, this was really what started it all for the kind of uh, low fencing. Um, in 2016, it wasn't always that way. We used a uh, you know, standard chain link fence with a bar, a foot of, six feet with a foot of barbed wire on top of that, right? We're a regulated utility. We're required to keep these sites safe. They are energized. Um, you know, so for all intents and purposes, we have certain rules that we have to follow with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to keep our critical infrastructure safe. We, as part of our development, we continue to do outreach um, with our stakeholders, both neighbors, NGOs, and regulatory community. And what we found out was, you know, these fences are just institutional look. They don't provide access for wildlife. So we started looking at ways we could change that. And there are certain ways we can meet those same regulatory um, hurdles that we need from a, a regulatory standpoint and keep this site safe um, <laughs> by reducing the, the, the height of the fence. So we've gone to a standard four, length, uh, four foot, four to six feet of um, field fencing. We actually turn it upside down so the, the larger mesh is at the bottom, which helps facilitate smaller animals moving through. Um, and then the most animals, your larger, charismatic megafauna can, can jump over and, and cross the fence as well. Um, I guess that's the last, pic, last picture. So the other, the other uh, component that makes us compatible is just kind of how our sites naturally exist with the landscape. Um, with solar panels, you can avoid uh, all your sensitive habitats and wetlands. So when you see aerial views of our sites, you can actually see these, these corridors and areas that we've avoided and we move panels around flowing through our sites. And it kind of naturally um, works with the landscape and provides that, that corridor compatibility. Uh, each one of our sites is, probably, is about 500 to 600 acres in size. We need about 400 acres or 450 acres of buildable space for a 74 and a half megawatt facility. That extra land is there for um, avoidance uh, measures and that ends up becoming um, you know, important corridors for wildlife to cross. So I think you know, our projects fit into um, you know, the corridor concept just by the, 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 the number of projects we have and how they're spread across Florida and the preservation measures we take place um, to enhance and preserve uh, the habitats that are inside our facilities. Well, thank you, Jeff. I know I got a lot of questions I'd like to ask, but I'm gonna be respectful to our <laughs> other, other uh, panelists today. But one thing that I, I wanna ask is, in my preparation, there was, a, there was a term that's used, it's agrivoltaics. And how does FPNL incorporate agrivoltaics? Is, what, explain what that is and how it's implemented. Yeah, so agrivoltaics is, is traditionally considered um, growing um, crops or vegetables underneath your solar panels. Again, you know, these are energized sites, but um, you know, if we're gonna continue the conversation of, of expanding more solar, this agrivoltaics has to be part of that conversation. Uh, we're working with a lot of uh, farmers and partners um, on, this, on this discussion. Um, so we actually have a couple pilot studies going on. You know, part of that stewardship plan is research and education. So we're working in Miami-Dade County where we've actually installed some de-energized rows of panels and then we'll be looking at, you know, what kind of crops and different species can we grow uh, underneath the panels. Realizing that, you know, we are still a regulated utility in the state of Florida, so everything we do has to be cost effective for our customers. Um, one of the other ways we meet the agrivoltaics or kind of dual use solar is working with uh, partners and farmers on leasing additional land that we have. We have a number of projects that we have purchased property and we do not need all that property. Therefore, we lease that back to the farming community. We've got sod farms, we've got row crops, we've got timber. Um, I've got a guy growing turmeric, uh, actually you know, just outside on about 10 acres of, uh, of property that we have at a, a facility in Okeechobee County. So we're looking at, you know, we're continuing to look at ways and exploring so we can uh, kind of get into that conversation of agrivoltaics more. 
Um, it's traditionally been done, or what you've seen has been done on kind of a smaller scale on the distributed generation side. So applying it to a large scale is, is difficult, but again, we're looking at you know, utilizing excess land. Uh, one other thing we're doing in Santa Rosa County is um, we're actually using sheep on one of our properties. And this is another pilot st study. Um, we're trying to grow that herd uh, on the site, which will help with grazing and help uh, m you know, reduce the amount of costs we have on vegetation management. So there's a, there's a compatibility there that you know, it's a win-win for both us in terms of keeping the grass cut, but also growing a, a herd of sheep for the shepherd and his flock. Well, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. I've learned a lot already, that's for sure. But as I said, I got a whole bunch of other questions too. It'd be really neat to engage yeah. later, and I'm sure other folks do as well. But we're gonna move along. Ms. Young, I tell you, you, you've got a lot going on in Visit Florida, that's for sure. And what statewide efforts are underway to promote the Wildlife Corridor? Well, Jeb, um, I'm, as I said earlier, my teaser, we're really excited to be able to share with you some of the work we're doing today. But just a quick um, overview of Visit Florida, and I mean quick. Um, Visit Florida is our state tourism marketing agency. Tourism is the number one industry in the state of Florida. It's about a $1.2 billion industry. And uh, we have traditionally, uh, uh, or, or our mission is to bring people from outside the state of Florida into the state. We're doing a little bit of in-state marketing now, but primarily outside of Florida in getting people to come spend their money here, which right. then builds our economy. Um, nature seekers and outdoor recreation has long been a part of our mission, in addition to what we think of as our core, right? Theme parks. 825 miles of beaches, but we know that there's so much more to the state of Florida than just you know the things that people in the UK or Mexico think of Florida. We are more than theme parks, although we love them. We are more than beaches, although we love them. And uh, the beauty of uh, pushing outdoor recreation and really educating the, the visitor on the natural offerings of Florida is that it benefits the entire state, particularly our rural areas who have so many of those assets. And so this year, in addition to the campaigns that we are already doing uh, for nature seekers and outdoor lovers, um, the legislature has appropriated $5 million to visit Florida to do a specific campaign on um, nature-based tourism and our 18 trail towns. And this campaign launches in October, so next month. Um, we are partnering with DEP and the Office of Greenways and Trails, and um, I'm really excited uh, that we're going to be able to motivate people from outside the state of Florida to visit and discover new parts of uh, Florida that they may ne never have known existed. So I do have a short video. I'd love to cue that if we can do it. So you won't be seeing that unless you travel to another state, but we do have an in-state component <laughs> as well. So you've, you've seen it the only time you're ever gonna see it. Um, but we, we do have an in-state component, which is not our primary mission, but we felt like this was so important that we need to get people that live here to understand the natural gems that we have around the state and start moving around the state and taking advantage of the 15,000 miles of trails that we have. Um, and it also gives, uh, it provides the ability for Floridians to have this sense of pride, a sense of place as they learn more about their state. So that's what we're doing for um, the corridor and trail towns right now. Well, that's very busy and I thank you for it. it so we have a $5 million investment by the Florida State Legislature. What kind of return is that gonna bring to municipalities and local governments and, and especially with out-of-staters coming in? 
Well, it is the, the number of out-of-state out visitors um, that come just for outdoor recreation and nature is quite significant. It's about 14%, but we get so many visitors that that is 19 million people coming to Florida pursuing nature-based tourism. So it's significant. And uh, we found that the visitors that come for these outdoor activities also spend time um, uh, enjoying some of the cultural resources of our state, about 25% percent are really um, uh, focused on fine dining so I guess they go outside all day and then they go to a really nice restaurant at night which is kind of my jam too I like that um, and, and they tend to support small businesses and so you know this is an opportunity for us to really support the whole state and all aspects of the, the state of Florida um, we are very as I mentioned before very focused on making sure that our rural counties um, get the attention that they deserve not only does it help build up their economies and then make the whole state better, but it helps disperse people out of some of our tourism centers like Orlando and Miami and Tampa. So it's a win-win. Um, we are very excited about this project. And again, we, we still are doing all of the adventure-based tourism that we always did, but this is just a new component and adds a new dimension. It certainly is a different dimension. A lot of people don't think about when it comes to tourism is actually the outside part of it, the natural part of it, and it's very helpful. Thank you very much for all that you do and your leadership on it. We'll move along, Mr. Alfano. I, I tell you what, you have a very interesting job interfacing between two local government entities, that's for sure. How does Blueprint Intergovernmental Agency fit into the piece of the puzzle of the Florida Wildlife Corridor in Tallahassee, Leon County? Yeah, absolutely excited to talk about that. So um, as I mentioned, we are uh, implementing projects from a one penny sales tax. We're in the second iteration of that blueprint sales tax. And the first 20 years of that sales tax had some traditional uh, infrastructure projects, uh, improving our and widening our ring road around Tallahassee. Um, but it also acquired uh, over 1,400 acres of our most environmentally sensitive lands. And now a lot of these lands are um, located in what is the opportunity area of the Florida Wildlife Corridor uh, or in close proximity to the natural forest, you know, the traditional conservation area of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Um, we also implemented a uh, stormwater project that doubled as a regional linear park project, the Capital Cascades Trail. Um, I'm really excited to talk more about that in our breakout session about trail towns uh, tomorrow uh, morning. Hope to see some of y'all there. Um, but the Capital Cascades Trail connects downtown Tallahassee, Leon County, to the St. Mark's Trail and down into the National Forest for the Capital City to the Sea Trail. Uh, with this second iteration of the sales tax, we are also uh, devoting $30 million outside of our traditional infrastructure projects, which have multimodal components, to just implementing greenways and trails project. Our Capital Cascades Trail project has seen a 10 to 1 return on investment in private sector investment after we put those local dollars to work. That's amazing, very amazing. Why trails? I mean, this is it. And I've heard the term Trailahassee. That's it. And we talked about this earlier. Trailahassee being thrown around in the Economic Development Agency. Why is Blueprint and the community so focused on trails? Yeah, absolutely. We love our trails. We're all in on trails in Tallahassee, Leon County. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows that when you invest on trails, your community sees significant benefits beyond the basic recreational benefits that you see. The American Heart Association has cited studies that show a three three to one return on investment for investing in a trail network to your community in terms of healthcare cost savings. It makes sense. When people exercise more, they're healthier, and they, they get sick less often, and then they, when they are sick, they spend less time uh, uh, being ill. Um, trails also have incredible benefits for real estate. Um, properties within close proximity to trail systems uh, regularly have been shown to have double digit property value increases in some cases as high as 20 percent um, and in addition to that um, trails uh, uh, properties in close proximity to trails are much more marketable they sell faster and they're num the number one thing that real estate agents say uh, uh, are, are in close proximity to those properties so it increases the value of properties and next to them but also there's some negatives that could come with it as well some people may say well boy that may not be a good place to be what about safety and those kinds of things yeah absolutely that's a that's a myth you know there is a lot of evidence that shows that when trail projects are built 
uh, there is no increase in crime and there's no increase in the perception of crime. Um, change is hard when, when new things happen near where we live, we're sometimes resistant to it, but um, you know, we, we see incredible benefits from the trails that we've Im <coughs> implemented beyond, like I said, just the quality of life uh, 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 investments and, and return that you see. Um, as part of the Cascades Trail, we built a pedestrian bridge that last year celebrated its one millionth crossing. Um, no, I, I'm not kidding, our one millionth crosser was this older gentleman who uh, was able to not have an automobile because the pedestrian bridge crossed a major state uh, highway. He was able to meet his daily needs on foot. And these trail projects are not just a luxury. They are multimodal improvements that allow all members of our community to tr travel around, whether they uh, choose not to use a car or are unable to afford one. Now here's the most difficult question you'll have all day from me. How, is it? Is there a challenge between working between intergovernment workings? You have to deal with the city of Tallahassee as well as the Leon County County Commission. That I'm sure goes quite smoothly. <laughs> there's a there's a joke that it takes two of them to hire you and only one of them to fire you. <laughs> yeah, no, we're uh, we're we're really excited to uh, to to uh, be given this uh, gift by the voters of our community that have chosen to invest in ourselves. Um, the projects that we are implementing really wouldn't be possible without this concerted community wide vision that honestly started with a group of developers working with environmental advocates, working with community advocates, coming together and saying we have significant infrastructure projects and it won't be without a community-wide vision that we'll be able to achieve these. Well, you must be doing a really good job if you still got a job, that's for <laughs> sure. Well, I tell you what, how many of you learned something today? Would you raise your hand? That's great. How many would you put those hands together, give a round of applause to our panelists today? Thank you so much. I know I can raise my hand. I've learned a lot. Thank y'all for taking time to participate today. Thank you, for each of you, for what you've done. Thank you, Dana, Jeff, Mr. Dr. Levy, that's for sure, and, and Michael as well. Thank y'all so much for what you've done. That right now, we're going to do, and we're going to take a break. Uh, from my understanding, there are coffee and snacks out in the foyer, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Y'all have a great day.